Let's pray now and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, thank you for these families. And thank you that we're a part of your family. That you are our father. And you've called us all your sons and daughters. Into your family, the church. You've given us your word. And your grace. Now, Lord, speak to our hearts. Open our minds that we might understand and our hearts that we might receive what you want to say to us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. This past summer, we, uh, we had our outdoor services. How many of you attended outdoor services here on the Kesslinger Lawn? Those are coming back in the summer months. We're excited about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the polite clap. Yeah. I'm also excited to tell you something else. Uh, starting next weekend, we will no longer require you to register for services. Woo! Yay! Unless you have children, oh, but that's to help our volunteers and know what we need. So if you don't have children to register for kids ministry, we're not going to ask you to register, which means we're going to increase the capacity, which we're clearly already doing, uh, in the room uh, for worship services. So obviously continue to worship online if that's where you feel most comfortable and God's speaking to you there, but we're going to increase the capacity across our campuses and no longer require registration. Some of you are wondering about masks. Trust me, we'll get there. God has brought us this far. We'll get there eventually. But we're grateful that he's brought us this far. And so from now on, if you don't have children to register, you can just show up to church. How about that? Remember the old days when you could do that? They're coming back. Uh, And lots more to come. And we're excited about that. So continue to pray for us and with us as we seek God going forward. This past summer at Outdoor Services, I met a man uh, who he came, uh, he he actually lived nearby and he heard the music. Uh, and he, so he kind of wandered in one uh, Sunday morning, and he came back the next week, and I got to know him a little bit. I was just walking around the lawn, meeting people. And I, he said that he's a, he said, I believe in Jesus, but I, I've sort of, uh, not sort of, he said, but I have no more use for organized religion. I don't affiliate with any church, but I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. And I said, that's interesting. Tell me about that. And he said, well, in my experience, the church in America, in the world, but particularly in America, is not what it's supposed to be, is not what it ought to be. On that point, I suppose he's not entirely wrong. Perhaps you know someone like that. Perhaps you've been like that. I believe, but I don't really need this thing called the church. Maybe you're here just because mom said, it's Mother's Day, would you please put on a nice shirt and come to church with me? Well, thanks for honoring your mom. We're glad you made it. The idea of a lone believer with a personal individual faith but no connection to a community is antithetical to what the Bible teaches, actually. It's just not in here. The message of the New Testament is that when you come to genuine faith in Jesus Christ, you come not only to a new personal identity and personal salvation through his death and resurrection, you do, but you also come into a community, the family of God, the church, capital C, around the world, throughout history, of which this church is lowercase c, just one expression in one place of God's family in the world. You can become a Buddhist or a Hindu, or a self-made religious person privately, individually. But that's not how Christianity works. To join Jesus is to join his family with all of its warts, with all of its imperfections. Uh, Let me just ask by show of hands, and those of you watching online can raise your hand if you like. But when you think of the church, when you look at the church today, are you ever disappointed with what you see? Anybody say yes? Mm-hmm. Those of you that don't have your hands up probably are in the, you're not listening to me. Right? <laughs> of course, of course. Let me ask you another question. Do you see pride, judgmentalism, selfishness in the church? Do you ever see that in yourself? Why, why do we look at the church and see these things and think, well, I don't want any part of that, but we look at ourselves and we see the same things. Any authentic community is going to be expressed the same brokenness, failures, hang-ups of the individuals that make up that community. The church is not different. It has not been different since the New Testament was written, since it started. Do you know that most of the letters written in the New Testament to churches are dealing with issues? We often think, well, if we go back to the New Testament church, back when they had it right, You know how many times the Apostle Paul and Peter, whose letter we're studying, have to correct the church, tell them to stop screwing things up, stop behaving this way? There are no perfect churches, because people are in churches. The church is not a club for nearly perfect saints. It's a hospital for recovering broken people. And we're in the last week of our series on the letter of 1 Peter called Living Hope. 
examining this remarkable letter written to Christians, part of God's family, living in Asia Minor over 2,000 years ago. And we've seen how remarkably relevant it is for us today. So if you have your Bible, open to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'll read verses 1 through 11. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, or you can follow along on the screens. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter's wrapping up this remarkable letter that we've been studying, and he's putting our lives that we're called to live, living hope, that our living hope lived out in the world, into a communal context, the context of the flock, the church. Those who say they like Jesus but not the church don't understand Jesus at all because Jesus loves his church, us, even though we're screwed up. Even though we are selfish, even though we're broken and prideful and arrogant and we get things wrong all the time, he loves us. And when we read this, this Pat, we've said this before, but the you in here, it's so, we're, it's so American for us to hear you as you individual, you singular, you personal. But it's, it's you all, all y'all, in other words. You didn't know that Jesus was from Texas, right? It's all of us. Collectively, Peter's writing to a collective group of Christians, the church. So hear it not only for you personally, but as we go through this, think about it communally. All of us, he's writing to. The main imagery or metaphor that Peter uses here is to describe the relationship of Jesus and his church is shepherds and sheep or a flock of sheep. This was deeply personal to Peter. If you remember the story of Peter, Peter... Peter, um, I, I draw strength and encouragement from Peter because he screwed up so many times, and yet Jesus still loved him. His great failure, of course, was his three denials. We know that story, the night of Jesus' arrest, betrayal, before his crucifixion. Jesus predicted Peter would deny him three times. On the heels of Peter boasting, even if everybody falls away, I won't. And Jesus goes, actually, not so fast. And Peter denied him three times and went outside and wept bitterly and then disappeared, thinking, he must be done with me, it's over for me. And when the rumor of the resurrection appeared, he ran to the tomb and saw it empty. You can only imagine Peter thinking, what's he going to say when he sees me after what I did? Anybody ever feel that way? What's God going to say to me after what I've done? And when Jesus does confront him, he asks him three questions. Do you love me three times? Each time Peter responded, you know that I love you, Lord. And each question is followed by a command. Do you know the command? Feed my sheep. If you love me, this is how you show it. Feed my sheep. Care for my flock. Feed my sheep. So when Peter writes this, this is deeply personal to him. He understands. And the first thing he gives us is the charge to the shepherds. Now the text says he's speaking to elders, which are overseers, leaders of the church, but more broadly, this refers to those that God calls to lead, guide, and care for his flock. Certainly, it replies to me as pastor, to our staff, to our executive council. But it also applies to, so you don't think you're off the hook here, anybody who God places in spiritual care over some other people, other Christians. You could apply these principles to. To all who offer care. Peter begins by calling out the motivation of the shepherds. The why. There's a lot of talk today about know your why for life. 
Well, Peter gives us the why for caring for others, the flock. It seems like it should be obvious, right? Why would you want to be in spiritual leadership? Why would you want to be in a shepherding role over other people? Why? Well, because of what Christ has done for, you, for me, for you, the chief shepherd, the good shepherd who loves me, who lays down his life for me. Apparently, Peter thought it was important in the first century to emphasize why, because people were getting it wrong, and I think it's important certainly in the 21st century to do the same thing. I don't know if any of you are aware of a, web, a website or an Instagram account called Preachers and Sneakers. Anybody ever heard of this? You could have some fun later today looking that up and then deleting it. Uh, there's a book out now by the same guy who was basically chronicling the lavish lifestyles of these of pastors and, and preachers wearing... I didn't know what a Yeezy was until I read the article. $5,000, $8,000, $10,000 shoes. But it's a metaphor for people getting rich off of the flock. Listen again to what Peter says here. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, not because you have to, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain or dishonest gain. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says it's not wrong for a pastor, preacher, staff member from a church to earn their living from, from serving the Lord. My family, my wife, and our three children were provided for the generosity of God through his people, all of you, for more than 22 years here. I'm profoundly grateful for that. I don't take that lightly. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about people that would get into this role of spiritual leadership for personal gain at the expense of the flock. And in verse 3, he says, not domineering. So not for profit and then not for power. Not domineering. How many are the stories today of abuses of power in the church? You could spend the rest of this morning listing them. We wouldn't even scratch the surface. It breaks God's heart. Biblical leadership is to be servant leadership. The sheep follow their shepherd, not because of their title, not because of their power, not because of their prestige, precisely because they sacrifice for the sheep. This is the model of Jesus. In John chapter 10, verses 14 through 16, we read these words, John 10, verses 14 through 16. This is the famous passage where Jesus calls himself our good shepherd. And he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Those other sheep that are not of this fold, you know who those are? Jesus is speaking here to the Jewish context. He said, I've got other sheep that are not of this fold and there's gonna be one flock eventually. You know who those other sheep are? Us. You. He's talking about you and me and us as a church. He's our model, the good shepherd. So not for praise, not for profit, not for power. It sounds like an indictment, doesn't it, on the contemporary church today in America? I, I can't tell you the number of times I've read an article or seen a post and someone who's, who's made a comment, I'm done with the church because of what they see another abuse of power or people getting rich off of false promises, prosperity gospel preaching. And I just, my mind immediately goes to how heartbroken God is, how angry God is, and how people are going to look at me, us. So if you think this doesn't apply for, to you, I would just encourage you, God may place you in spiritual leadership over somebody, some people, and pray for the shepherds of the flock. You have to have a shepherd's heart to do shepherd's work, is the point Peter's making. And he's our chief shepherd. Recently on our executive council, which is our version of elders here at our church, we went away on a, on a prayer retreat uh, to at Lake Geneva, uh, some of our staff, Pastor John Bechtel, Abe Doncel, me and our executive council, to pray and seek God for the future. And I just, I tell you, those people are examples to me. Encouraging, praying uh, on our faces and knees before the Lord, asking hard questions about our culture, about what God wants for our church, trying to seek the chief shepherd's will. So in other words, as a shepherd, you seek the chief shepherd's will in order to lead those God's placed in your care. And moms and dads, you're shepherds of your family. 
If you're a small group leader, if you're in charge of children, if you're a teacher, there's a shepherding influence you have in your life. So seek the chief shepherd. Let him lead you as you lead others. Now look at verses 5 and 6. He goes on here in 1 Peter. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Clothe yourselves, he says. It's a fascinating imagery. It's over and over in the New Testament. This, the Greek construction literally means to put on like, a, like an outer garment. Wrap yourself in, clothe yourself in, put on humility. How do you do that? How do you... Well, I was uh, working out with a group of guys uh, yesterday, uh, yeah, yesterday, yesterday was Saturday. We were running hills. We're old men now, but we we're, you could call it running, but anyway. And uh, we're, they were talking about the sermon, uh, and we were finished, and one of them said, you know, humility is my best quality. <laughs> I've been working hard at it. I'm surprised all of you haven't noticed how humble I am lately. It's disappointing you haven't remarked on it, right? So not clothe yourself in, like, I got a new jacket, I want people to notice. Clothe yourself in humility, like it's something you're proud of, you're showing off. What does it mean to clothe yourself in humility? Humility is a fascinating thing. It, it, we don't elect people for humility, at least not in America. It's not, if you're a truly humble person, it's by definition not electable in American politics. We don't praise and honor our cultural icons for being humble. The NFL draft we just, we just had, which I'm thrilled about the Bears pick, they didn't pick Justin Fields because he's humble. He might be, but I don't, that's not the guy you want throwing passes, right? We don't praise that. The Oscars don't go to the most humble. Corporations don't hire CEOs for the most humble person. But the Bible, over and over and over again, consistently talks about humility as the key quality God wants for his people. What it means to follow Jesus. Let me put it this way. Humility will always be in direct proportion to your grasp of the greatness of God. Humility is not primarily about your relationship to other people or your understanding of yourself. It impacts those things, but it's primarily your understanding of your relationship to God. This is what John the Baptist said, right? Do you remember this story? John's got a following. He's got disciples. His, there's buzz about him growing, and all of his disciples and the, the people are starting to go to Jesus. And his closest friends come and say, John, you got a PR problem. Everybody's going to that guy. We need a new campaign. We've got to do some surveys. We've got to figure out popular opinion and get the you know, people back on your side. That's not exactly what they said, but something like that. And John said, famously, he must become greater. I must become less. Understanding yourself in relationship to God. He must become greater. He must increase. I must decrease. And when we see that properly, then it affects how we see other people. So humility is not being an introvert. Some of you are like, well, I'm very quiet. I don't want attention. Yeah, but I bet you're pretty proud of that, aren't you? <laughs> That's not what it's about. It's not having a low view of yourself. This is where humility starts, not in your relationship to other people, but in your relationship to God. C.S. Lewis writes this, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud person is always looking down on things and people, and of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Ian Murray wrote a book about humility called Humility. And he famously said this, nothing is more at odds with the natural orientation and inclination of the human heart than genuine humility. We are not naturally humble people apart from Christ. You might think, yeah, but I, I don't want attention. That's not what it's talking about. Pride lurks in every heart. The upfront person, the behind the scenes person, spiritually speaking, has a wrong view of themselves in relationship to God until God reorients that. We are not naturally humble people. Until, until he comes to us, and his grace changes us. So just to drive this point home, I want to take you through just a little comparison chart here between proud people and humble people, because sometimes I think humility is best defined by what it's not. So we'll see this on the screen. Proud people are self-conscious. Humble people are not concerned with self at all. Proud people desire to promote themselves. Humble people desire to promote Christ and others. Proud people are defensive when criticized. 
Humble people receive criticism with the humble and open spirit. Let me pause there for just a minute. A friend said to me once, a truly humble person is one who will allow others to say about them publicly what they would say privately to God. Right? I know that I'm a sinful person. I know that I'm proud and angry and impatient and arrogant and greedy, but I don't want you to say it. Leave that to me and God, please. All right, back to the chart. Proud people are concerned with the consequences of their sin. Humble people are grieved over the cause or root of their sin. Proud people are concerned with looking respectable. Humble people are concerned with being real. Proud people are easily offended. That's everyone. Humble people are hard to offend. Proud people are rarely content with what they have. Humble people live with a genuine heart of gratitude. Proud people don't think they need much from other people. Humble people are deeply aware of how much they need God and others. I don't think of myself or like to think of myself as a proud person. But I'll be honest, reading through that list in preparation for this sermon, reflecting on it, meditating on it, I have to, I don't check all the boxes very well. I line up on the wrong column too often. And in Peter's letter here, he says that God resists the proud. Whoa. Think about that. If you're proud, God resists you. The Greek word is antitasso, meaning he, is set him, he sets himself up against you. To set against. That's not a good place to be, friends. The worst possible condition in your life is to find yourself being opposed by the living God. And he's saying... Pride in the human heart puts you in that position. So if, we, if you read through that list, if we as a church read through that list, it should cause us to repent. Oh God, forgive me for my pride. Break me of it. I don't want you resisting me. And then he goes on to say, God gives grace to the humble. Gives grace, favor, blessing, presence. He exalts the humble. The surest way to be brought low in this life, in God's sight, is to be raised up in your own sight. And then in verse 7, which we didn't read in this one moment ago, but we did when we read through the text, he says, casting all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. So God gives grace to the humble, God exalts the humble, raises them up, and God cares for the humble. Interestingly, Casting your anxiety and fear onto God is a sign of humility. So if we flip that around, holding on to your anxiety and fear is a sign of what? It's not a trick question. Let me say it again. Casting all your anxiety onto God is a sign of humility. Holding on to all your fear and anxiety is a sign of pride. Now, I'm not talking about anxiety disorders that need treatment and medication. That's a different thing. But... Refusing to surrender what we worry about to God is actually a sign of pride. I, 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 don't, I don't know if you can handle this one, God. I better take this, please. It's pride. A truly humble person casts their anxiety on him because you know he cares for you and he holds all things. This brings us to the warning to the flock. Warning to the flock. Remember, the you here is plural in Peter's letter. Let me read to you verses 8 through 9 one more time. Humble yourselves, therefore, he says, under God's mighty hand. And then in verse 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We have an enemy, Peter says. As God's people, the church, we have an enemy. And it's not the socialists, and it's not the greedy capitalists. It's not the evil Democrats. It's not the MAGA hat wearing alt right people, right? We have an enemy. It's not those that are in education passing all the bad policies. It's not those that are, are, that are elected that we don't like. It's not the economy. Who's our enemy? It's not the guy across the street or next door or on Facebook that you can't stand and you block. Who's our enemy? We have an enemy. A spiritual, real enemy. As God's people, our enemy is Satan. Now, I know some of you are probably here going, really? Come on. That's not, he's not a real guy. 
It's not red tights and a pitchfork. I mean, that's just a metaphor, just a personification of evil in the world. I think one of the great tricks our enemy plays on us is to get us to dismiss this as silliness. Again, from C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, I do not think you'll have much difficulty in keeping the patient, Christians, in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, he therefore cannot believe in you. Peter's warning us, we have a real enemy that seeks to undo what God is trying to do, to destroy. Peter, in keeping the flock analogy, uses the image of a prowling, roaring lion. Now, interestingly, he says prowls around like a roaring lion. If you think about a lion stalking its prey, do they roar? No. They're quiet because they want to sneak up on them. But he says roaring. The context here is suffering. When we experience discomfort, suffering, persecution for our faith, the enemy roars. And what does he roar? It's not worth it. God can't be trusted. God isn't good. This is foolishness. Why don't you just go with the culture? Everybody thinks you're ridiculous. And Peter says, you're not alone. You're not alone when that happens. Remember, we're called to resist him together. How does a lion uh, attack a, a, a flock of sheep? Do all the lions line up like a great battle in line? The sheep on one side and the lions on the other? right? It's not going to be very close if they do. No. They isolate one from the flock, the weakest, one separated. Remember, this is a letter written to us as the church. So when he says, be sober-minded and watchful, he doesn't just mean personally watching your own heart, which you should. It means watch out for each other. Do you ever do that? Do you ever think, who's vulnerable in our church family that, that I love? Who's, being, who's struggling? Who's being tempted? Who's close to giving in? Who needs some support in my prayer and encouragement? He says, be sober-minded and watchful, not just over yourself, but over each other. We, together. Satan may roar, but ultimately he's been defanged at the cross. James chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. James puts it this way. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submission to God and humbling ourselves under his mighty hand is how we resist. It's how we hold fast. Because we know what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, when he says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Isn't that fascinating? The God of peace will do it. The Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So be watchful, be sober-minded, resist, and this brings us to the promise for us all. The last thing Peter says, the promise for us all. We get a hint of it in verse 4 when he says we get the crown of glory from the chief shepherd. Crown being a symbol of honor uh, that we're, that we, uh, those who have sought to be faithful to Jesus in this life will be honored in the next And the honor that he bestows on us, we give right back to him in worship. That's the image of your crowns. Not that we're all walking around with crowns, like King Julian from Madagascar. Look at my crown, everybody. That's not what we're doing. The crowns that we're given because God honors us for our faithfulness are given back to him in worship, laid at the foot of his throne. What's the promise then? Let me read verses 10 and 11 one more time. And after you have suffered a little while... The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ. That's us. Right now, look around the room for a minute at the top half of the faces and sitting next to you. He has called us. It's not just you individually. We have been called, the God of all grace has called us to his eternal glory. This is beyond comprehension. That's where we're headed. 
you will be in his presence someday more alive and at home than you've ever felt in this earthly life and at peace and secure. We're told that he's going to do all this. What's he going to do? Specifically, Peter says he's going to restore you. All that you've suffered or lost in this life. I have dear friends who long to see children that, they, that were miscarried in this life or that, were, that, that died early in, their, in, in infancy. They're waiting for them. Restore to you. That's not just flowery, you know, abstract language. It's real restoration. All that's been lost and taken from you in this life will come back to you and infinitely more in the presence of Christ. All regrets, all shame, all failures, all wounds, completely healed and restored. It says that he will confirm you. No more doubts, no more questions about God or yourself. You will know who you are and who he is. You'll know yourself in his light. The Revelation says that you're going to be given a white stone with a new name, known only to the one who gives it to you. Meaning you have an identity in Christ that you just barely glimpse in this life. And everything in our culture is fighting against it, attacking it, trying to tear it down. And every now and then you get a little hint that, oh, I belong to Jesus. I forgot that. That's right. But most of the time, it's seen through a glass darkly, Paul says. Someday, it's going to be confirmed. You'll know that you know that you know who you are. He'll strengthen you. All the frailty and weakness of this life will be gone forever, COVID included. Body, mind, and soul in perfect strength. I mentioned I was out running hills with some guys. You know, we all moan the fact that we can't walk the next day. (laughs) We're breaking down physically. Outwardly, Paul says, in this life, we're wasting away. But inwardly, we're being renewed. But there will come a day when you'll be fully strengthened. Not restored to your 21-year-old self or whatever your best self was, but infinitely greater than you can imagine. He'll establish you, Peter says. I'm so tired of hearing about uncertain times, unprecedented times. Someday, in the presence of Jesus, you will be established. There'll be no uncertainty. There'll be nothing to worry about the future. You'll be deeply rooted in in the foundation of his love and grace. Remember, if you're part of this series back in chapter two, the cornerstone You are being built together in him, the chief cornerstone, to become a holy temple in which he dwells by his spirit. Someday that'll be complete. That building will be complete. And we'll be part of it. Last little verse, and then we'll wrap up. Verse 12, I I didn't read this for you, and it's not on the screen. Peter says this, by Sylvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him. Pause there. Sylvanus, we don't know anything more about this guy. Some think it might be Silas, uh, uh, the friend of uh, Paul and Timothy. But he's called a faithful brother. Isn't that a good name? Wouldn't you like to have your name recorded in the Bible as a faithful brother? He says this, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. That's how Peter ends. This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Cultural opinion comes and goes. Popular uh, views about what's right and wrong and what's politically correct and what's in and what's out, those are like shifting sands and winds. This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. I know it's going to feel to you at times like you're outliers in society, like people think you're weird and may even come against you. It may even cost you something. But remember, you're not alone. Your, Your brothers and sisters throughout the world and throughout history have suffered the same things. This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it, he says. Stand firm in it, because someday he, your chief shepherd, will appear, and when he does, he's gonna restore all things. He's gonna confirm you, your identity in him. He's gonna strengthen you, and he's gonna establish you. So stand firm. This is the true grace of God. You're gonna go from here on this Mother's Day to brunch or whatever it is your mom wants you to do. Tomorrow morning, you're going to get up and go about your life. This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. There is no other hope. There is no other grace by which, Peter Peter says this, there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we may be saved. This is the true grace of God. Jesus Christ, him crucified and him resurrected. On that foundation, the church is built. Peter's writing to us as the flock, right? 
Stand firm in his grace. Let's stand together as we pray and then we'll worship. Father God, we worship you and we praise you for the way you have poured out your grace into our lives. We don't deserve this grace, we're not worthy of it, but you've called us not just individually for a private relationship, but into a family. And we're just sheep, and we wander, and we stumble, and we get lost. But you're such a gracious shepherd. Help us to humble ourselves under your hand, that we trust you to raise us up. And in your strength, together we resist, and we stand firm in your grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus, our chief shepherd. We pray this in your name. Amen.